as translators how to cope with, with uh, different types of translations, in particular scientific and technical translation, and uh, how to develop uh, subject knowledge as well, which obviously is very important, and how to develop this knowledge quickly, <laughs> and, and build up glossaries and add glossaries to catch tools, and so on. <coughs> and so forth. So this is part of what I call the scaffolding of the translation students to, uh, to be aware of what is technology and what technology can do for you. So um, that's going to be a bit my, my premise. So what I'm going to, to do in the next 40 minutes or so is to give you an overview of what terminology is. Terminology is Sometimes forgotten uh, in in translation, um, in the masters of translation, uh, is is taught as uh, as an add-on if and when you you need to to um, to to deal with terms and and and, and glossaries and so on. But I think it is very important for students to uh, to become uh, familiar with uh, the uh, discipline of terminology. Not just because it's so important for them for their development as as, uh, as translators, but also because of their employability. Because uh, obviously terminology is becoming more and more important uh, in terms of developing standards uh, of uh, uh, de developing applications for the web, uh, in the semantic web, and um, and so on. So there is an element there of of employability as well for for. Students. So this is what I'm going to cover over the next uh, few half an hour. <laughs> so um, I mean, to start with, with what is terminology, uh, clarity, conceptual clarity, and uh, and te terminology is the, the discipline concerned with the study of concepts and terms and the relationship between special languages. Again, it's very important that the students. Uh, understand the difference between language for general purposes and language for special purposes and the, the different uh, ways of tackling uh, both uh, types of, 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 of language. And the theory of terminology comes in handy because it's concerned with a referential system which relates knowledge structures to lexical structure and defines the constituent elements of each type of, of structure. Um, so, if we want to uh, really um, get into the conceptual framework for different domains, uh, we, we need to study those domains also from the point of view of terminology. Uh, terminology is also professional activity and that's where the employability comes in as well because obviously uh, is. Uh, involves uh, practices and methods for collecting terms, describing them, and presenting those terms, and what sometimes is called as terminography. And also, obviously, it, uh, terminology is a way of talking about terminological glossaries, so lists of terms that obviously we want our students to, to collect um, in order to provide consistency to their translations and, and reliability. And again, it's very important to link terminology to language for special purposes uh, because terminology can only be understood in relation to those uh, specialized texts and, and addresses of a variety of purposes which are related to communication and information. So we have to link terminology to language for special purposes this is not sort of a, a, a general text or a literary text. And I think it's important that students uh, realize that. And as uh, Miriam say, uh, technical scientific texts uh, have a, a, a typical discourse which, which is very specific, is formalized, is codified. Um, the function tends to be communicating information of a specialist nature at any level with the aim of informing or initiating parties in the most economic, precise and unambiguous terms possible. But then, of course, uh, as, as we have seen uh, when, uh, when Miriam was, was giving her presentation, the, 
this is not exactly so in, in real life. Okay, so we, we, we get with, uh, with terms, with, with text that sometimes are ambiguous or, or sometimes uh, they are not as objective, but they are subjective or they are persuasive and so on and so forth. Um, they have, however, uh, particular characteristics as, well, as we have already seen uh, in the media presentation. Uh, they tend to have a specific subject matter, which is technical or scientific, high density of terms. Um, the intended readers tend to be other specialists, but there are different levels as well. We, we have expert to expert, or expert to initiate, or semi-expert to semi-expert, or semi-expert to layman. And, and this is important as well uh, for the students to realize that there are different levels uh, of specialization. Um, written informal style, highly structured, lots of graphs, uh, tables that are going to cause problems when you use hard tools and so on. Lexical restrictions. Uh, phraseology is again very, very important when you are dealing with specialized texts because unless you get the right collocations, the right phraseology, it's not going to sound uh, like, a, like a text written by a, by a native speaker. Kind of um, sound like a forced translation. Uh, there is a tendency to use certain grammatical constructions and tendency to use long strings of nouns and objective nouns. So actually, to study technical and scientific discourse, uh, extracting these uh, these points is very important as well for students. This is an example, uh, and I give this to my students and I ask them to underline uh, everything that they think could be a candidate term and, uh, and it's very interesting because uh, some, it's not obvious if uh, at, the, at the beginning what can be a term candidate or not, uh, what can be a compound or what, what can be a single term and sometimes the students tend to go to underline words that they don't know. Um, so they could underline methodological. I said, well, I don't know how to translate that. I said, well, fine, but you know, uh, <laughs> for, for this particular domain, that would not be a term candidate. So it's, it's very important as well for students to start kind of developing this awareness of what could be terms, a term candidate in a particular domain and how important that would be for uh, doing mining, uh, mining of terms and they start to develop certain knowledge. But as you can see, there is a high density of terms. So I would tell my students, don't start with a, with a text like that, because it's very hard to chew. <laughs> so maybe start by a popularized science uh, magazine where you can actually uh, comprehend what they're going to tell, uh, what they're going to say to you, and start maybe with Wikipedia, why not? and then start building your subject knowledge, go to semi-expert to semi-expert, and then go to expert to expert. But once you've got the subject knowledge, because otherwise it's going to be impossible, you would not understand anything. Um, obviously, the difference between terminology and terminography, um, again, terminology is supposed to be an ambiguous and precise and so on, but then, you know, real life is, is messy. And people talk about terminology when they really mean terminography and so on. So the practical terminology would be the terminography and it focuses on the collection, description, processing and presentation of terms which belong to one or more LSPs in one or more languages. And the work uh, is an activity concerned with the systematization, representation of concepts, um, or with the presentation of terminologies on the basis of established principles and methods. And is the part of terminology that deals with the production of terminological dictionaries, glossaries, thesaurus, and, and so on. So again, I think all translators at one time or another, or most of the time, we should say, are involved in, uh, in doing terminography work. Uh, it is important as well to um, to, to relate terminography to lexicography, uh, I started working, 
as a lexicographer many years ago, not so far from here in Glasgow with Collins Dictionaries. And, uh, and I think that's why I became so <laughs> involved with, uh, with translation and then with the terminology as well. But whereas lexicography is concerned with language for general purposes, the general vocabulary of the language, um, we start from the meaning, um, sort of words, and then describe those words, describe the meaning and the use of those words, um, and recording all the senses and sub-senses and so on. Termi terminography is basically uh, involved or concerned with language for special purposes, and, the, and it works the other way. It works from the concept to, uh, to the term. And uh, usually you don't find many connotations, although sometimes you do find connotations, especially if there are metaphors involved and so on. Um, but also you will find issues with register that you have to be aware of. <coughs> but basically the objectives of terminology for a, for a translator is to achieve consistency and clarity of communication. If you've got good reliable glossaries, your, uh, your translations will be reliable and will be consistent and the quality, the quality of the translation will be better, which is uh, very important. And there is obviously the work of terminologists, uh, especially the ones that are involved with the standards in terms of regularization, unification, standardization, which is also an important uh, job. And uh, we we start with discussing with the students uh, basic concepts like what is a concept, what is, what is a term, what is an object, and we go to the basic notions, the semiotic triangle, um, which is a, a very kind of graphic, simple way of, uh, of looking at the basics of terminology, concepts as unit of thoughts, um, abstractions on the basis of property common to a set objects, the object, which is anything that can be perceivable or conceivable, but can be material, but they can also be immaterial or imagined. And the term, which is the designation for that concept. Okay. Um, so concepts in the special languages are units of specialized knowledge with a unique set of characteristics, qualities, properties, and relationships. And again, I think uh, when, we, when we start looking at concepts in, in, in specialized languages, is, is the way of building that subject knowledge that we need to uh, acquire as translators and we need to acquire it very quickly. It was very interesting this morning when people were dis discussing whether it was, uh, it, it was better to train specialists as translators or to get sort of linguists and train them as, uh, as translators, giving them subject knowledge. Yeah? Um, and I, I think, in a way, it is better to, to take linguists and then uh, offer them the possibility of developing that subject knowledge. Because um, sometimes it's very difficult for, uh, for a specialist to, uh, to understand the, the linguistic side of things and, uh, and it's so complex to, to think about terminology and about the style and about uh, discourse and, and, and so on. And, um, and I have worked with some specialists that have tried to, to do translations and they send them to me to, 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 to revise and, and they were very poor. I mean, the, the, the terminology might have been very good. <laughs> But the style was, was dreadful and, and it was very clunky. So, so there were, there were uh, obviously they hadn't been trained very much, but there was a little bit of problem. So, anyway, back to the presentation. So, it, the concept of hammer, represented by the term hammer, does not refer to a specific hammer. <laughs> so, it's just basically that uh, kind of conceptual framework of, of the qualities, the characteristics that. that uh, certain objects have that we can consider as, as uh, classification under the concept of hammer. And, um, and concepts are not bound to any particular language.
So we, we, we will have one concept and then lots of different terms, one in French, one in Spanish, one in Chinese, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, concepts and, um, and terms are influenced by the social and cultural background. So for instance, if we have a concept, which is a universal concept, it can be bread, okay? Um, it would be a very different concept for somebody in Marrakesh, or, or in Angola, or, or in China, or, or, or in Paris. <laughs> so we will all have uh, different kind of objects that come to our mind, different tastes, and, and, and so on and so forth. They are also influenced by the quality and quantity of the certain development in certain domains. So sometimes we have a, a, a very sort of sophisticated terminology in certain areas, um, for instance, leather uh, in, in, in the, uh, I mean, if, you, if you go to North Africa, they will have lots of, lots of different terms for leather, whereas here we would probably have just one leather, <laughs> or suede if you are happy or something like that. So it, 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 it actually quite cultural bound, and, uh, but also it, in, in, in relation to research and development. And then the different types of concepts, entities that usually are kind of nouns or activities, verbs or qualities, uh, adjectives or nouns and relations, verbs, adjectives, nouns. I mean, some terminologists used to say, no, 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 terms can only be nouns, but actually not, because there are lots of uh, uh, verbs and, and even adverbs can, can be also um, terms uh, in some cases. Uh, again, we've got individual concepts and general concepts, and sometimes obviously there is a clear relationship between them that you can see here. And, um, and conceptual systems. Um, I think, again, once we go beyond the idea of uh, singular concepts, <coughs> I think it is very important for students to realize that when, when you are dealing with uh, special languages, you really are dealing with a conceptual framework. And that conceptual system uh, means that all those concepts are going to be related in many different ways. And it's very useful to see those relationships when, when you start studying. Uh, a special language because it is very handy when you have to write definitions, for instance, to know, for instance, um, in, in, if they are synonyms, they have to have the same definition, but if they don't have exactly the same definition, they are related terms, but in which ways, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of the terms, obviously the designation of a concept in a special language by a linguistic expression, and it can be words, symbols, formulas, acronyms, designating uh, a single concept in a particular special language. However, we've got problematic cases, we've got polysemy, so for instance virus can be used in, in medicine, but it can also be used in IT, uh, mouse, uh, exactly the same, and so on. So again, we've got uh, different images and metaphors, and, 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 and also we, we have constantly um, a kind of uh, a movement um, between general language and the special language, yeah, so words become terms by a process of terminologization, and, uh, and, 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 and the opposite, some terms become parts of the general language. Yeah? So you might have a, a, a bridge, which is part of general language, and then you might have a bridge used in dentistry, because they look very similar, and so on. And, and, and this process is, is, is happening all the time. You've got uh, also, uh, concepts that can be represented by more than one term, like the term of Nicholas and rubella, and sometimes there are issues with register there that we have to be aware of. And uh, homonymy as well, that can be uh, a problem when terms present one, two or more unrelated concepts in different fields. So obviously uh, students also have to be aware of that. And uh, types of terms, obviously we've got single term, compound term, multi 
long-term unit abbreviations and so on. And sometimes for students, it's very, very difficult to actually um, know the, where they, how to input terms into a glossary. And they, they especially with multi-term units in English, because you put three, four, even four items together, and where do you cut it, or, or is it a whole term? So that, that is, a, again, that is a big problem for students. And again, you have to go back to the idea of concept. If it's a concept, if you can define it as, a, as, a, as an entity with special characteristics, it doesn't matter if it's one unit or two units or, or, or three units. You are defining what is the concept, go back and, and, and look at it, yeah? and so on. Uh, again, phraseological units, very important. Some people say, don't include those things in glossaries. Yes, please, in, include those things in glossaries. And uh, funnily enough, now with catch tools, catch tools tend to go for segments as well. And segments uh, are very, very useful uh, for capturing uh, phraseological units as well, which, which are really very important. Um, obviously, primary term formation, that is uh, usually not something that we do with the students creating uh, terms uh, or, or proposing neologisms, but sometimes, uh, especially because of research and development be, being sort of um, going at different rates, sometimes the students find in translations that a particular concept that has a term in English, um, maybe the concept <coughs> exists in Spanish, but we don't have a term yet in Spanish. So you have to deal with these things and you have to be aware of how, how terms uh, are created to start with, uh, how do you realize that these are new terms, and sometimes they might be in italics and they appear next to the definition and then you know that it's, it's something new that uh, it appears in a research paper, you might not be able <coughs> to, um, to find it uh, in, the, in the other language. But that, what, what do you do? Then is secondary term formation. You might decide then, as a translator, to leave it in English and, and, and give an explanation in Spanish or in Russian or something like that. Um, but you know, <coughs> there, is the, there is a conversation to have there and how to include it in your glossary and so on. Do you need a compilation note that says that there is a terminological gap and so on and so forth. Um, so there are different methods, uh, direct borrowing to start with, or a paraphrase, or, or a long translation sometimes, or a new formation, or an adaptation. Again, when a new concept uh, enters a language, sometimes you get lots of different, uh, several of these methods at the same time, because different specialists are coping with the terminological gap in different ways. So some of them will use it in English, some of them will paraphrase, uh, and so on. And at the beginning, everything is very messy. And, but the students have to accept that, that that is what's happening. And maybe in their glossaries, they have to input all the kind of equivalents that they find, maybe with a note of which ones are more frequent, or which ones appear in the most reliable sources, and so on. But again, the same as with translation, is, is a process of um, problem <coughs> solving, problem solving and, and, and thinking of different ways of, um, of dealing with issues. Terminology research then can be thematic or systematic, uh, if we are taking a subject field, and, uh, and, and this can be done, I've, I've done a little bit of work on, on, on marketing, uh, creating a glossary of marketing and actually sitting with the specialists and the specialists were creating the, the, the conceptual trees and, and, uh, and so on. And that's a very interesting way of doing it, especially if you are going to publish a uh, terminological dictionary of marketing or something like that. It's a good way of doing it. What our students tend to do is the specific or ad hoc uh, terminology research. So basically they, they, uh, they have
have a number of texts um, I don't know, of technology, and they, they put them together, they analyze them, and then they build their own uh, glossaries based on the analysis of those uh, texts. Uh, it's, it's, it's more corpus that they prepare. And this is typically what translators do. Yeah. Um, obviously, a subject field um, kind of terminological project would be something like the Unified Medical Language System, the UMLS terminology uh, services. And this is a meta thesaurus, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the most complete medical terminology uh, that you can find. And, uh, and also, it includes obviously concepts like the shop type. But then all sorts of uh, examples of, uh, of terms related to those concepts. And, uh, and of course, this is, this is fantastic. And you also will get it in different languages as well. And one of the applications of, of this type of work is to create uh, electronic health records uh, and, uh, and also through this type of work with uh, sort of bilingual input, you can work towards uh, a kind of um, automatic translation as well to improve um, automatic translation uh, services and facilities. Yeah, that's another example of what you can do with this metathesaurus, picking up different uh, concepts from different glosses and putting them together and see how they are related in the in, the, in a conceptual framework. Uh, and again, that's, that's, that's very useful for research in the terminology and machine translation and conversion uh, uh, For our students, uh, our students in Salford have to do a terminology project. And, uh, and basically, it's a way of providing as well some specialization for the students. So the students uh, pick up a subject that they're interested in. It might be solar power, for instance, if they're interested in that. And then they, uh, they put together a sample, a, a, a corpus of representative texts on solar power in English and then in, in Spanish or in French or in Chinese and so on. And, uh, and then the corpus, obviously, they, it can be processed manually or it can be processed electronically, yeah? And there are different ways of doing that. Uh, students have access to concordances, but usually don't, don't do it through the concordance. They do it sort of manually, but, but, but there are good concordances like uh, Wordsmith uh, tools that, that allow for um, for processing uh, those uh, the, the corpus, and, and basically what you get is a, a keyword in context concordance, which again is very useful to um, to look at frequency of, of, of terms and, and also phraseology issues of phraseology. So so that that's something that can be taught to students as well so that they are more aware of, of how to, to do this ad hoc uh, terminology research. And, um, and, and again, it can be done automatically, but that usually requires a lot of IT knowledge, which is beyond, obviously, what our students are required to do. So what we start by doing is, okay, you've got uh, a, a, an area that you would possibly like to specialize in for translation and you want to build a glossary, where do you start? Again, start from expert, semi-expert to layman documents, as I said before. You can't start with the highest level of complexity. You have to start by actually reading things that you can understand and building that knowledge, going up a level to expert to semi-expert, check terms, definitions, um, start creating your glossary, and then start adding um, equivalences, uh, check the standards, technical specifications, glossaries, and so on. Seek a specialist uh, help if needed as well. I think it is very important. Um, I think uh, Sarah was saying it this morning, she said, well, sometimes when I'm doing a translation, 
I send the client um, some some issues. This is ambiguous. Uh, this is unclear, and so on. So you you can involve the specialists uh, in in just to make sure that your glosses are reliable. <coughs> Um, so basically you start uh, extracting all these key concepts, uh, definitions, concept relations,